I really believe that uh, that we're primarily spiritual beings that happen to have a soul living temporarily in a physical body. Okay, you know, a lot of doctors see it the other way around. We're we're, we're primarily a physical body that 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 happen to have a soul and maybe or maybe or maybe not have a spirituality. <laughs> right. right. So, so they got it upside down. Let's ditch the quick fix and dive into today's conversation. Welcome, everybody. My guest today is Dr. William Leake Cowden. Uh, Dr. Cowden has studied integrative medicine since 1975 and has practiced integrative medicine with great success with his patients from 1986 to 2019 when he retired from private practice in order to pursue full-time teaching. Dr. Cowden is internationally known for his knowledge and skill in practicing and teaching integrative medicine. He has contributed to many health books in addition to those he has co-authored, has written numerous articles on integrative medicine, and has pioneered successful treatments of cardiovascular diseases, cancer, autism, Lyme's disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and many other illnesses. Dr. Cowden has treated many patients who were sent home to die by allopathic doctors but are still alive decades after their terminal prognosis. He accomplished this by restoring hope in the minds of those patients and helping them call on the power of God for their healing. Dr. Cowden believes that the source of all healing is the one and only living God. Welcome, Dr. Cowden. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here today. It's great to be on your show. Yeah, thank you for joining us. I, You know, there's just a, a ton of information uh, that you've got at your disposal to share with us. And I'm going to try to just tease out a couple of, of good pieces there and, and would love to have you kind of share uh, whatever you feel you want to share that would be helpful. So I, I think, you know, it's always a good idea to just kind of have you kind of share a bit of your history. I, and part of the history, you know, I'd like to see how you transitioned or what, what your initial goal was in medicine. And, and, and maybe it wasn't a transition to integrative medicine, but kind of share your history with us and, and we'll kind of go from there. Well, I had lived in uh, arid West Texas uh, all of my life growing up. And then I got accepted to medical school in Houston. And I moved to Houston. and I was not used to the the high humidity and the grass and the weeds and the mold and the fungus and everything else that was in the air. So soon after I moved there, I developed uh, allergic rhinitis, then allergic sinusitis, then allergic bronchitis, and then infective bronchitis, then pneumonias. Oh, man. And uh, so I was going to the chairman of three different medical school departments to get advice, uh, allergy and immunology, uh, the uh, you know, the uh, ENT doctor and the uh, pul pulmonary specialist. And so I followed their advice explicitly and took their drugs and I uh, got progressively worse. And uh, thank goodness my wife's grandmother came to visit us. She was a school teacher and self-taught nutritionist. She saw the misery that I was in, uh, had pity on me, took me down to the local health food store, got me on some vitamins, minerals, and herbs, and I got well in about a month. And I thought, my goodness, I need to learn what this woman knows, and I need to take with a grain of salt everything that I learned in the medical training after this. Wow. So, so I started, anytime I had spare time in medical school, I didn't read medical textbooks and medical research articles. I, I read books on nutrition, books on herbalism, books on electromagnetic therapies, uh, and so on. And so by the time I finished medical school, I was already pretty, pretty skilled uh, in my knowledge in integrative medicine and was applying that information to my family and my friends. Um, and I went, uh, went ahead and went through uh, internship or residency in uh, inter, you know, internal medicine and then did two fellowships in St. Louis, uh, cardiology and critical care medicine. And out of, after I finished that training, I came out and went into a joint uh, partnership practice with a fellow that went through the training at the same time that I did. And, uh, so for one year, uh, we were doing critical care medicine in intensive care units in seven hospitals and 11 intensive care units in wow. St. Louis. And uh, at the end of that uh, year, I decided several things. One is that if I kept that pace up, I wouldn't live to be very old. <laughs> the second thing I figured out is that if I kept that uh, practice up, that I, I probably would end up in divorce and, and wouldn't know my children. Uh, but the, the, one of the big issues was that I didn't feel like I was uh, doing what God called me to do. You know, I, I'd already found Christ by that, you know, by that time, and I wanted to make sure that I was doing what God wanted me to do, not what I wanted to do. And so I, uh, I switched to uh, integrative medicine, 
and uh, you know, doing more outpatient medicine than inpatient medicine. And uh, it, uh, it took off from there. Soon after that, we moved to uh, Dallas and opened, opened up a practice. Couldn't find anybody else to join that was like-minded. So I just you know, rented an office space and opened up the uh, practice. And uh, the pa- God sent lots of, lots of patients. You know, patients started flooding in. And, uh, but, but they didn't all have cardiovascular disease. <laughs> uh, when, when the patients would initially come uh, the, uh, with cardiovascular disease, they'd see that I knew a lot about other things. And so they would send their friends uh, with cancer and autoimmune diseases and other conditions. And so I got a lot of uh, practice treating, you know, those types of patients as well. That's a, that's a fascinating story. I didn't, I didn't know that part about you. So thank you for sharing. So as you moved from West Texas into Houston and, and got exposed to all those new world uh, exposures, it kind of led, you know, obviously to uh, your grandmother, I think you said, having pity on you and, and helping you through the, the, the difficulty you were experiencing. And but that also gave you a great experience. God's good at giving us those life experiences. Right. Um, yeah. And so what did you find uh, in your studies about how you know, molds and those different types of exposures it affected the, the immune system and ultimately respiratory system. Yeah, well, I've, I've continued to learn about mold and fungus. That's a huge topic. And, um, you know, I, I think a large part of what I was dealing with in medical school was, uh, you know, sensitivities uh, and toxicity from the mold in the air and also the uh, mycotoxins that they produce. What I've, what I've learned is that if a person goes into a mold infested building and takes it, you know, spends enough time there and breathes a lot of that stuff that's in the air into their respiratory tract, that pretty soon those mold and fungi set up shop in their, na- in their nasal passages, in their lungs, and in the paranasal sinuses. And so a lot of doctors think, well, I'll just give them a drug and that'll go away. Well, no, it doesn't. Right. Because you, you can't achieve a high enough level of the pharmaceutical drugs in the uh, in the interior of the sinuses to get rid of the bone and fungi there. So what I, what I learned is that your first thing you have to do if you want to get rid of mold and fungus in, in a patient, you have to get rid of mold and fungus in their house, in the workplace, in any place else they spend much time. So you have to you know, evaluate for mold and fungus and, re, and uh, you know, stop the water leaks and re- remediate the uh, work, workspace or house, house space. And then the next thing you have to do is to get them on a ketogenic diet. If they continue to eat sugar and starch, you cannot get rid of mold and fungus, no matter how much bug killers you give them, they continue to have mold and fungus. So you have to put them on a ketogenic diet. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a, you know, a lot of meat. It can be a purely vegan ketogenic diet sure. if, if, they, if they choose. And then uh, you put them on uh, you know, different types of Usually herbal therapies work better than pharmaceutical therapies, in my experience, for two reasons. One is because there are multiple uh, antimicrobial substances in each uh, herbal product, not just one chemical like you found in pharmaceuticals. And so the bugs can't develop resistance to it very easily. And then uh, the other thing that I found is that if you don't uh, do sinus irrigation, uh, you don't you don't get enough of the bugs out of the sinuses, so the bugs continue to flourish even if you've stayed on the ketogenic diet and and done the uh, you know the uh, antifungal uh, agents for a, even even ten weeks. But if if you're doing sinus irrigation, ketogenic diet, and anti and the appropriate antifungal herbal, uh, usually then uh, in ten weeks time you can be free of that uh, problem for the rest of your life as long as you've cleaned up the house and the and the workplace. Yeah. And so, you know, your, uh, your, like, again, your history, you said you had rhinitis, sinusitis, you had bronchitis, all the itises, you know, we're in a time now where there's, there's, you know, all kind, you know, cold and flu is coming around every year in the fall and the spring. Yeah. Um, you know, we have the COVID history. Uh, when we talk about, you know, these kinds of things, you know, not feeding the molds and the viruses that sugar, because that's what they like to live on. That's a, yeah. that's a huge tip. Uh, there's some other remedies that are out there for just, you know, the upper respiratory type of conditions. And, and you're mentioning the nasal irrigation, but I think it, you use iodine. And uh, I think we, yeah. you know, you yeah. and I talked just briefly a little bit about high, uh, nebulizing. And so any thoughts on those things? If you're going to use uh, iodine in your nasal irrigant, uh, it's very important to uh, first put a drop of that 
let's say Lugol's iodine on your skin and make sure you don't have an allergic reaction because if you put it in your nasal irrigation, you put it in your sinuses and you have an allergic reaction, that's going to be a very bad situation. Uh, and then, you know, after you verify that it's okay topically, then you can put one drop in your nasal irrigant and, because if you put more than one drop, it burns the heck out of your nose. Too and much. out of your sinuses, yeah. And so then you gradually, every time you do a sinus irrigation, which is usually once daily, you build up the number of drops to get up to about, oh, eight drops per cup of a sinus irrigant. And, uh, and usually that's enough to kill most fungi that are in the paranasal sinuses. And the, the other reason to go up slowly is because uh, most people in the United States are bathing in chlorinated water, sometimes even drinking chlorinated water. They're Right. They're uh, getting fluoridated water on their skin right. and, and in their, uh, you know, oral ingestion. And then they're getting bromine from, you know, soda, drinking sodas and uh, eating brominated uh, wheat products and so on. And so all those are, are halogens also, you know, chlorine, fluoride, and bromine. Right. And th those will uh, actually compete for the receptor, Finding receptors sites. and cells for, for iodine. And if, if you if you just give them a big dose of iodine, the iodine pushes all those other things out of the off the cell receptors and makes a person really sick for several days. But uh, but if you start with one drop and build up slowly, then they can usually handle that. Get get used to it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And then the the hydrogen peroxide nebulizing. Yeah. Uh, have you been utilizing that? Teaching that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I. Uh, I did it in a limited fashion until I read uh, Brownstein's article about a year and a half ago. And I thought, well, if he, if he's boldly saying it in a, in a re peer reviewed research article, I should probably, you know, be uh, more bold about uh, telling others about that. And uh, so what, what I have, have uh, patients do or had patients do before I retired was to, to get uh, the 3% hydrogen peroxide from the pharmacy. And they got to read both labels on the, on the farm. Uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, there's a, an active ingredients label and an inactive ingredients label. The active ingredients is, is the hydrogen peroxide, but on the inactive ingredients, if it says anything other than water, don't buy that one. <laughs> you know, it's got uh, you know, uh, preservatives and stabilizers and other toxic chemicals. So you just want hydrogen peroxide and water in your hydrogen, in your 3% hydrogen peroxide bottle. And then you, you put uh, in the beginning one eighth teaspoon of that in a nebulization cup along with one teaspoon of water. Distilled water is better. Uh, and and then then you uh, have, a, have about a one to nine dilution, which is enough to where it won't irritate the uh, respiratory tract significantly. After they do that for a bit, if they feel like they're not making fast enough headway, then they can increase the concentration of the hydrogen peroxide in the nebulization to uh, one quarter teaspoon of hydrogen peroxide and one teaspoon of distilled water to which which would make a one to five dilution and that's usually uh, strong enough to uh, kill off most critters in the uh, paranasal sinuses the mold and fungus that you breathe the bacteria that get in from the air and, and other routes in the even the viruses yeah and, and and ultimately yeah when you're saying kind of stepping up if you're feeling like hey i'm tolerating this pretty well it doesn't seem like my airways are and my sinuses are getting too irritated yeah, you can kind of boost that up a notch, kind of like you were saying with the with the iodine. You, you kind of start slow, kind of incrementally go up and see what your body can tolerate. Right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a, that's a very useful tool. And, you know, I think, you know, the, the Bible predicts that there, in the end of days, there'll be lots of plagues. Uh, you know, I don't think the uh, people in the Bible that wrote the Bible uh, understood that man would possibly be the person the, the the ones that were creating those plagues <laughs> but uh, uh anyway right uh, right we, we need to we need to be prepared for whatever comes our way uh you know the bible says that if we know christ and uh, we call on his name that we can be healed from de deadly poisons and you know, plagues and everything else but a lot of people don't know god don't know christ and uh, are kind of uh uh out in the out in the ocean without an oar Right. And uh, so they, they need another uh, another solution to the problem. And that's where the you know, hydrogen peroxide nebulization comes in for a lot of them. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'm going to come back. I'm going to circle back on that conversation about, you know, healing through prayer and and, and knowledge of, of God. And 
uh, I know there's a there's a verse I I like in Exodus. I think it's Exodus chapter 15. But you know, if you'll if you'll follow me, obey me, you know, you won't suffer any of these diseases. You know, and and what I, yeah. what I'm hoping we're able to do for people is help them have in many toolboxes that they can go to in their cabinet. You know, and hydrogen peroxide is one, and iodine's another, and vitamin D, vitamin C, and all those different things, and healthy nutrition, and understanding that you know all of these diseases all of these diseases that we have problems with at the very minimum uh, are encouraged to continue to thrive if we don't do very well with our nutrition and we keep on feeding them, you know, things that help them grow and prol proliferate, but also some of those things that you're talking about with, you know, hey, look at that label. Is it got ingredients that are going to make your body weaker? Because your body has to de has to deal with anything that you consume or anything that you are exposed to, so it, there's a lot of variables that come into play. So, but yeah, I do want to circle back there. But I thought I would uh, ask you about a couple other conditions that you've you've been treating over the years and teaching over the years. One of them uh, is autism. I, I was curious uh, your your work with autism. If you might kind of go into that a little bit, what maybe some of the history is and what the prevalence is and was and you know what you're what you're seeing with autism. Yeah, in uh, in 1980, the incidence of autism was one in ten thousand. The incidence of autism now is one in fifty. It's so scary. it's increased just a little bit. Oh, scary. <laughs> uh, I mean, astronomical increase. the The first case of autism that I treated was the son of a friend of mine, a naturopathic doctor. Uh, and this uh, boy, when I first met him, was seven years old and he wasn't speaking. Uh, and uh, the doctors that he was seeing said, he'll never speak. And uh, the, the parents were very distraught. They were owners of a restaurant. The father decided, since I can't get any help from the doctors, I'm going to go ahead and go back to naturopathic school and learn how to help my son myself. And okay. So, so he, he did that. And uh, so that was a good start. You know, he, he started, you know, doing some things for his nutrition and helping him to detoxify and things like that. And, uh, and so I met this naturopathic doctor and he said, uh, can you help me with my son? I said, I'd be glad to. So we worked together and in about a year's time, he was speaking and uh, the doctor said he would never go, never finish high school. He'd never go to college, never have, never get married, never have children. Never, never, never. Okay, so right. the, I call it the the the, the, the nocebo effect. You know, if you if, if the doctors say those things and they believe it, then it becomes a, a, a reality. Right. But it, but if you say, okay, I, I don't believe that, I, I reject that, I cast that out of me like a spiritual curse, then uh, then it doesn't have to be so. So anyway, uh, by by the time he was eight, he was speaking uh, sentences. Uh, he finished high school uh, with bees. He went off to college, played football in college wow. uh, on a scholarship, uh, made bees in college, uh, finished his college work, then uh, became a massage therapist. Then he started to learn all kinds of other things that connected to massage therapy and health in general. Uh, then he married. Then he had two children. Okay. So everything that the doctor said, never, never, never came, came to pass because, you know, the, the dad and the mom and I did not let the, that of the doctor put us in a box. Right. Or put, God in, or put God in a box, more importantly. Yeah, absolutely. And so what were some of the the therapies that you utilized uh, to bring him into, yeah, starting out? Because there's so many children that are uh, autistic that are non-speaking. And, and I've, I've been exposed to some of the therapies out there that have, that need more exposure, quite frankly. But what, was, what were you doing uh, at that time to help him? you know, go down the road that way. Yeah. Well, well, each child with autism is unique, you know, so, you know, they all have their underlying causes and they're not the same from child to child. Uh, they're, they're all toxic. So you have to do, you have to detoxify uh, okay. the different things that they're toxic from, you know, so sometimes that includes, uh, you know, so infrared saunas. Sometimes it includes uh, oral uh, chelators, uh, always includes increasing the, the mineral intake into their body because the minerals push out the uh, toxic heavy metals and so on. Uh, if they have mercury amalgams in the teeth, they have to get the mercury amalgams out because the mercury is, uh, is, is very neurotoxic. 
Right. And uh, if the mom had mercury magnet than her teeth when she was pregnant with the child or if she breastfed after the child was born, then the child is loaded with mercury in their brain. You got to get the mercury out. Uh, the most effective mercury binder that I found is uh, is the NBMI, also called emeramide, from Dr. Boyd Haley. Okay. But, uh, but you can't get it very easily. You have, to, you have to go to another country before you can get it. Before you can find it. Yeah. 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 But, uh, but anyway, there's there's a variety of other you know metal binders. You know, e- even a cilantro tincture works pretty well at getting mercury out of the brain. And, uh, you know, so you do that and some cracked chlorella orally to bind it in the gut and carry it into the toilet. And, uh, you know, over the years I've had, you know, lots of children with autism that uh, had no speech, had no, you know, they they were just, you could tell they were in pain because they were always banging their head and running around screaming and and holding holding their head with their hands. And uh, so every, every one of these kids that has autism has, uh, in the beginning, has severe inflammation in the brain. And so you have to do things that will settle the inflammation down. Sugars always make the inflammation worse. So you got get, got to get rid of the sugars in the diet. Ketogenic diet usually works pretty well for them as well. And then, uh, you know, once you start settling down the inflammation with uh, the diet and with uh, specific anti-inflammatory herbals and homeopathics, then over time, they, uh, they start getting better. I had two little boys that came to see me out in, uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona, not too long after I moved out there for four years. And uh, one boy was three and the other one was four, uh, but neither of them were speaking. Well, they, they had one word, echolalia, you call it. So if mom said something, they would say the same word, but it was obvious they didn't understand what they were saying. Okay. And so... Uh, by that time, I had developed a technique called laser energetic detoxification. And so we did this technique, laser energetic detoxification, daily on these boys. And on the fifth day, they were both speaking sentences. So sometimes it's that simple. Uh, you know, others, you know, you have to get rid of the, the Lyme disease in their brain, or you have to get rid of some other uh, parasite in their brain or whatever. But you know, energetic testing helps tremendously to know what you're dealing with. Otherwise, you know, you can spend tens of thousands of dollars trying to do allopathic testing and still not find the right answer. So, gotcha. yeah, so I, I, uh, I learned uh, muscle testing in uh, 1990, a naturopath that I had helped to get uh, over advanced liver disease and uh, uh, advanced uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, came back and said, Dr. Calvin, I'm amazed that you, with just doc, with dark field microscopy and a few other tools, you're able to find out that I had parasites in the bowel and gave me the appropriate treatment for that. And I got well. And she said, but uh, do, do you know uh, muscle testing? I said, uh, no. <laughs> and she said, well, we'll do that with your fingers. So I did that with my fingers. She said, and I hold it really tight. And so she tried to use both of her hands to pull my fingers apart and she couldn't. So she went to the next one, and the next one. Finally, when she got the little finger, she could just barely pull that one apart. And she said, okay, she, she reached down in her purse and pulled out a pack, packet of NutraSweet and stuck it on me and said, do that again. And I, and I could not keep my fingers together, no matter how hard I tried. And I said, well, that's interesting. <laughs> She said, well, you need to go to, uh, you know, to uh, classes to learn uh, muscle testing. I said, I don't have time to go to classes. She said, okay, well, here's, here's a, a sheet from Versendahl that uh, shows you where on the body the different points are. So, you know, see if you can learn uh, muscle testing on your own. I said, okay. So, so for the next year, every new patient that came in before I looked at their chart, uh, talked to them, did a physical exam or anything else, I would walk up and say, Hello, I'm Dr. Cowden. You don't know me from Adam, but I want to pull you on your fingers for a few minutes before we do anything else. And they'd look at me in a really puzzled way, and and they'd say, "Is it going to cost anything extra? No. Is it going to hurt? No. Yeah, go ahead and pull." Yeah. <laughs> so so I would commit, my, commit myself on writing what I found by the muscle testing, and then I would go through the history, the laboratory tests that they brought, uh, the you know, the dark field microscopy and, 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 their, and physical exam and everything else that I did and, and see, you know, what kind of, what kind of uh, things I was able to find by muscle testing. So at the beginning of the year, I was, uh, I, I was able to predict which tests were going to come back abnormal from the laboratory about 15% of the time. But by the end of the year, it was 85%. Just from so, muscle testing. Yeah. From muscle testing. So I increased my diagnostic acumen by sixfold in one year. That's awesome. I said, oh, that's not too bad. That's so, awesome. so then I learned, um, you know, 
point testing on electrodermal screening, and then I started learning uh, other types of electrodermal screening. And so now, uh, well, when I when I was finishing up practice, what I what I found is that if you if you want to be most likely right when you're trying to help a patient, find more than one interject test that agrees with another. Okay. And, in, in ancient Hebrew tradition, if one person said it so, it might be so. If two people said it so, it's probably so. If three people said it so, it's so. Now, that doesn't work in the United States right now because there's too many pathological liars. Wow. But, but, it, but it still so does true. work with energetic testing. That's so true. And you had found some success with that, it sounds like, with autistic patients. And it, did you use uh, some of the Vega testing uh, as far as the electrodermal mm -hmm. testing, the German mm -hmm. uh, methods? Is that what you were utilizing, that Vega test? Yeah, well, I, I used uh, the the first electrodermal screening system I used was a, a, a called a Computron, which is very similar to the system that Dr. Vol was using in Germany. He's the father of electrodermal screening, gotcha. and with that, you you touch the probe to a very specific acupuncture point, what's called a control measurement point on the digits, the fingers and the toes, and and you get inter information about the organ systems that are attached to those points. And then, uh, you know, after trying to teach that to other practitioners and not having success, I thought, well, I got to find something else. So I, I moved to uh, an Asira device, which is uh, doesn't require learning the points and having exactly the right pressure and direction and all that stuff. And uh, and got pretty good results, but uh, but the guys that ran that company wouldn't uh, keep up with my desire for news testing program protocols and testing items and so on. So I moved over to the Zyto after that. Hey, well, you know, just kind of on a, on the, uh, the data there for the autistic children, it is, it is crazy, you know, one in 10,000 and then 1980s, one in 50. Now I know there's projections for it to be one and two by 2050, the way the, the, the ball is going and, and so many yep. exposures, toxic exposures. Um, a couple of good books you're probably familiar with, J.B. Handley's, uh, he's written a couple of books, one directly, basically both of those are um, regarding his son who is autistic, a non-speaking autistic child, and, and he was yeah. able to um, uh, connect with the lady on the East Coast that was using a technique called spell to check. And for me, as I'm reading the second book, because I had read the first book, I'm just tearing up as they're finding out that their son, Jamie, was able to really understand pretty much everything they were communicating, but they didn't have any clue that he was basically a genius, but was not able to have that autonomic motor connection work, you know, yeah. and, and she was able to help that happen. And, you know, uh, the nutrition part of it is so huge. What about uh, your work with chronic fatigue syndrome? Yeah, uh, when I was in the practice, big practice in Dallas, uh, a lot of patients started coming to me with uh, incapacitating fatigue because I guess in 1987, soon after I moved to Dallas, my, my oldest sister moved to Dallas also. And uh, she came to the office and said, uh, I want to see you as a patient. I said, okay. And uh, she, I said, what's your problem? She said, I have incapacitating fatigue. Most days I'm so exhausted, I can't even get out of bed. Mm -hmm. I'm trying, I've, I've recently divorced. I'm trying to raise two teenage children. Uh, and I'm, I, I feel like if I can't get some significant help very soon, I'm just going to commit suicide. Mm. I said, no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> and so I didn't know very much about you know, chronic fatigue syndrome at that point. Uh, I said, okay, first thing we're going to do is find you a, uh, a doctor that will be your primary care doctor. I'm not going to be your primary care doctor. I think that's a bad idea. So I'll give I'll I'll learn as much as I can learn about chronic fatigue syndrome, and I'll give that that doctor information, and that doctor can do your testing and your, your and recommend your treatments and so on. She said, "Okay." So uh, so I went to the biggest medical library, medical school library in in Dallas, and spent the entire day there, and could not find one article about the problem. I thought, oh my goodness, I don't know what I've done here. <laughs> I might I might have bitten off more I can chew. So so I left the, there, and, and this was in the evening time, and I went to the health food store to to get something. I thought, well, they got a book a book you know a books supply here. So I started looking through their books, and there was a book from Jesse Stoff that said chronic fatigue, the hidden epidemic. I thought, well, my goodness, I didn't I didn't know. <laughs> so I bought the book and read it that weekend, and. Uh, and it was amazing. I, there were several things in there that, that seemed to resonate. So I told the 
my, my, my sister's a doctor about it and uh, said, here's the test that he suggested that you do. Almost every test in that book that he recommended was positive in my sister, even though she had been seen by 15 other doctors across the country prior to that and never, never one of them found one abnormal test on her. Wow. And so every time we found an abnormal test, we would work on trying to correct the abnormality that we found. And in about a year, she was pretty much completely well. And she, she's fairly vocal. <laughs> so when she would go to the health food store to get the stuff that I recommended, uh, she would talk. And the, the health food store clerks learned that I knew something about chronic fatigue syndrome because, you know, she was suicidal when I started and well within a year. So pretty soon the health food store started referring all their chronic fatigue patients that they couldn't help. And uh, so at one point I had 500 chronic fatigue patients in the practice. That's amazing. And so it sounds like a, a lot of the utility there was addressing the, like you said, 15 areas, I think you said of positive tests yeah. uh, with elimination, probably of things that she needed to eliminate and then nutrition and, and supplementation. Is that kind of where you were going with it? Yeah. Well, she had, she had a variety, she had leaky gut. She had a variety of food allergens. She had mold and fungus in her gut. Uh, she had lived in a moldy house, but she no longer was. So at least I didn't have to try to get her to remediate her house. She, she had no no money at that point to, to, to do big ticket items like that. And uh, she was she was really toxic from a lot of other things too, not just mycotoxins, but from uh, heavy metals. She had mercury maggots in her teeth, uh, fortunately only two. So we were able to get those out and then detoxify her from mercury. Uh, she had pesticides and herbicides and solvents and pharmaceutical drugs that all those 15 other doctors had given her and she was toxic from those. So we worked on getting those out with infrared sauna and other, and other therapies. Very good. Yeah. And, and she's, and she's doing well. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, so many, so many of these things overlap, you know, whether it's, you know, the autism or the chronic fatigue syndrome or, you know, the, the chronic sinusitis and repeating, you know, uh, viruses and colds and things of that nature, they, they all kind of have these kind of overlap. The immune system is, is kind of getting bombarded from various, um, you know, even in the womb, like you said, uh, exposures. And, out, and as soon as you get outside the womb, uh, just there's a ton of exposures. So is that what you found in your practice, that kind of that commonality when mm -hmm. we're dealing with just these kinds of health, including cancer? And I know you, you work with yeah. cancer as well. Yeah. There was a study that was done by the environmental working group on 10 newborn children, and they, they assessed them for the number of toxins that were in their body, and it was uh, 287 different toxins in the newborn. Wow. Okay. I'm aware of that. So, so the toxins were coming through the, from the mom through the placenta into the fetus during the entire pregnancy. And so these kids come into the world loaded with toxins. So it's you know, little wonder that uh, with you know one or two more insults, whether that's a vaccine or a uh, a, a pharmaceutical antib antibiotic or whatever, that that tips them over into full blown autism or at least uh, uh, what they call uh, 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 you know Asperger's, uh, Asperger's or, 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 or or the least in that same category as the uh, ADD ADHD, which is yeah. the, the least severe form of autism. Yes. Uh, I, I was not aware of that, that that was uh, that kind of toxic load right out of the womb. Uh, that's a, that's an interesting, sad yeah. reality. Uh, yeah. Dr. Uh, Antoine Beauchamp was actually the, the person that figured all that out uh, back. Uh, he was a contemporary of Louis Pasteur. And Beauchamp said the environment is everything. And he was talking about the internal environment of the body. And you know, when you accumulate enough physical toxins, you create an environment in the body that makes it easy for microbes to grow and hard for the white blood cells to take care of the microbes. And so it's a bad combination. And so I've learned over the years that uh, the, the emotions cause the body to hold on to physical toxins more avidly and in specific locations. And then once you accumulate enough toxins in that location, then the microbes start accumulating there. And then the white cells try to come, come in and try to take care of the microbes that are there and the white cells release cytokines and you know dilate blood vessels and cause inflammation and cause pain. And so that that's you know ultimately the the cause of the of the syndrome is the 
you know, the emotions that triggered the physical toxin accumulation, which triggered the microbe accumulation. Yeah, and then you get the toxic overload and the overload and the over response of the immune system and imbalance of, uh, of such. Um, it, which kind of leads to when we talk about the emotional side of things leading maybe towards, uh, you know, you kind of touched on it initially, you know, the connection between uh, good health and, and ultimately God, uh, you know, so the spiritual health, you know, aspect, though, I know that's something that is a very strong part of your approach to taking care of patients and teaching. Um, I know one of the things I like to share with people when it comes to nutrition, just in a general sense in my practice is, um, you know, simply, you know, it's kind of hard to read all the labels, it's kind of hard to do all the different things and all the education and all that, but it is a journey. And that's the whole idea of this podcast. You know, it should be a journey. Life is a journey. You should try to, you know, you can switch gears at any point. Um, but when it comes to nutrition, I usually like to say something simple, like if God has made it, it's probably good for you. And if man has manipulated it in any way, uh, it probably has some negative effect and, and sometimes very negative. Um, so that, you know, that's kind of a simple reference to saying, you know, uh, God's kind of given us a whole lot of what we need if we, we'd start to learn about it. Uh, and, and that's just in, in the creation, but, uh, which I'd love to have you touch on that if you'd like, and, and, but also, uh, touch on the, you know, the, the spiritual wealth, uh, spiritual wellness opportunities that people could have, uh, and maybe have, and maybe could accentuate. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I really believe that, uh, that we're primarily spiritual beings that happen to have a soul living temporarily in a physical body. Okay. You know, a lot of doctors see it the other way around. We're, we're, we're primarily a physical body that, that, that happen to have a soul and maybe, or maybe, or maybe not have a spirituality. <laughs> right. So, so they got it upside down. But, uh, anyway, uh, even a lot of uh, Christians uh, have a significant amount of, um, I call it soul wounds, which are deep emotional wounds that uh, either they picked up in the womb from mom or dad, or that they picked up early in their childhood, and they're not consciously aware of those wounds. And so those wounds uh, create open windows and open doors that allow the demonic realm to have an influence in their life. So, you know, the, the demons have been around a long time and they've been observing our behavior for all of our life. And so they know where our, bus our buttons are figuratively. So they, they know how they can induce fear or they can induce anger or they can induce another strong emotion. And it's my belief that the, that the spirit, the spirit, you know, the demo demonic spirits actually thrive on and live off of those emotions that we, have, that we emote. And so, you know, if we if we don't want to keep feeding the demonic realm, we need to you know learn where our our buttons are and uh, learn what the uh, soul wounds are and resolve those and uh, and and get to the point where we're uh, you know working uh, you know more for for God and less for the demonic realm. And uh, you know that there, there's a lot of tools. I mean, for for a person that doesn't know Christ, uh, recall healing works really well. Uh, Recall Healing comes out of the work of Dr. Reiki Hammer in Germany that, that uh, developed uh, German New Medicine. Okay. Uh, H-A-M-E-R. And uh, Dr. Hammer uh, was a board-certified oncologist whose, son, his, whose only son died from a gunshot wound inflicted by an Italian aristocracy who never came to justice. And uh, when Dr. Hammer's son lingered in the hospital for a while and finally died, Dr. Hammer developed testicular cancer, which is very unusual in a 50 something year old man. Hmm. And then and Dr. Hammer's wife developed breast cancer and she had never had a cancer in her life. And so he figured out that probably they both were affected by the emotional conflict of the loss of their son. So he worked on resolving the emotional conflict uh, and without surgery, radiation or chemotherapy, they both went into remission from cancer. And so he started using those, those principles on his patients at the hospital for ovarian cancer, testicular cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, and so on and so on. So over the course of several years, he, he treated uh, 6,000 patients uh, that way, just asking, asking them the right question and, and uh, them having an aha moment and spontaneously releasing the, the trapped emotions and the trapped beliefs that are attached to the emotion. And uh, he... 
pub- he, he tried to publish his uh, information, but in order to get something published, uh, it was required that that somebody in the university where he was would either replicate or refute the research, and they refused to do either. So he got upset about that and started speaking out in the radio and TV about the fact that they wouldn't do what they were legally required to do, and they had him arrested for inciting the public against the uh, medical establishment. And so wow. in, his, in his trial, well, uh, the, the prosecuting attorney actually went, uh, got all the records from Dr. Hammer's office while Hammer was waiting in jail for his trial. And uh, the attorneys uh, had, had his office staff contact all of the family members, 6,000 uh, 6, know, patients or family members, to find out the status of the patients. And, uh, and so when it came time for the trial, Dr. Hammer's attorney knew that that attorney had done that and knew what the, what, 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 what the, the, what the attorney would have, would have found. So something that's probably never happened before or since, the, pros- the, the defending attorney, Dr. Hammer's attorney, got the prosecuting attorney on the stand to witness in behalf of Dr. Hammer. <laughs> okay so under oath the prosecuting attorney had to acknowledge that they contacted all those patients and their families and found that 92 percent of them were still alive and well five years after Hammer treated them okay that's awesome and, and so so you know the the average five-year survival most of those are stage three and stage four cancer patients and their average survival usually is is about uh five percent for the stage four cancers and about 20 percent for the stage three cancers but 92, 92 is a whole lot more than either. Yeah. That is amazing. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. so the re- re- recall healing incorporates recall healing. that and some other things. Yeah. And so what are some of the methods that you use for emotional well-being and, and you know, kind of boosting spiritual health for those that, uh, again, not all that are listening or that, that maybe you've come in contact with were followers of Christ, but there's some applications, biblical applications that you know, uh, you don't have to be a follower of Christ to get the value. God, God gives us son and all the other things we need, um, irregardless. Yeah. Uh, w- one other, uh, tool that I use for people that don't know Christ, uh, is called Evox. So with, uh, Evox, the patient speaking into a microphone, the microphone is not recording their words, but it's recording the frequencies that are embedded in their voice as they close their eyes and visualize a person or an event in their life. And after just uh, 15 seconds, you see displayed on the computer screen all the emotions and all the beliefs that are attached to that person or that event with a 95% predictive accuracy. Nice. And, then, and then the device uh, converts their voice frequencies into a homeopathic homochord, uh, basically a higher frequency of that, of that same uh, voice frequency, and delivers it back to the patient with an electrode, th- you know, through an electrode. So the patient then gets a... Uh, uh, a release f- of the cellular memory of that event. And uh, so patients see huge difference in just one session instead of, uh, you know, 10 years of sessions on a couch somewhere with a psychologist. So that's a useful tool. But uh, for, for those that, uh, you know, can't, uh, that don't know Christ and can't afford that, if, if they will just open, be open to the possibility that God can heal and they're open to the practitioner that's working with them to pray with them and pray for them, uh, I've seen some some miraculous healings that way as well. Uh, I've, I've received words of knowledge previously from God as I was working with patients. Sometimes as I was praying with the patients, and uh, so I would. Uh, I remember one pa- a woman with uh, uh, panic attacks, where she was having to go to the hospital uh, at least once or twice a month to get uh, in, in, you know, intravenous medications to deal with the panic attacks, and uh, so. Uh, the word of knowledge I got was that s- something had happened to her two months before her birth. Mm. And uh, I said, okay, I'll ask her about that. I said, uh, I believe that uh, something happened to you two months before your birth. She said, I don't remember that very well. I said, I, I understand. <laughs> I said, is your mom alive? Yes. Well, can you go ask your mom if something happened about that time? So she went to ask her mom and her mom said, oh my goodness, I've forgotten about that. Forgot about what, Mom? Well, two months before you were born, I was in an auto wreck, and the seatbelt, uh, I felt a huge pressure on, on my pelvis from the seatbelt when, when, when the car stopped suddenly, and I started having some vaginal bleeding. I thought I was going to lose the pregnancy, so I was in petrifying fear for about two weeks wow. until I saw that the pregnancy was perfectly fine, and then I forgot about it, and I never thought about it again until now. And uh, so the patient came back to the office and told me that story. I said, well, that's, that's, that's really good. 
we can pray about that. So we prayed. We, this, this woman didn't know Christ, but we prayed. She, she allowed me to pray, and, and, and she believed. And so uh, she never had another panic attack ever after that. Oh, that is awesome. That's yeah. a great testimony. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of Christians think, well, you know, I, I've accepted Christ. I've been baptized in water. Uh, and so that's, that's all I need to do. Well, that's really the beginning. You know, if you don't, if you don't look for and redress the soul wounds, then you're going to continue to have open doors and open windows through which the divine realm can influence you. And if you don't recognize that you could have generational curses affecting you and do something about that, you know, you could continue to have a lot of turmoil in your life that's otherwise avoidable. I, I teach people about the, about the generational curses and so on. Gotcha. Yeah. It's such a huge part of health, you know, and, and I, I would argue, and I think I said this already, uh, you know, I believe it to be the foundation of health. And so uh, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. And I'm, I, I think that you probably have so many uh, stories that you could share. Um, but I, yeah, I encourage people to, to, you know, kind of uh, look into those two options, three options that you've kind of shared. And, and, you know, for, yeah. for me, the prayer power of prayer is, is, is amazing. And to have that kind of, uh, insight that God gave you on that patient is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. and one of the things when I'm asking patients in my office about their history, you know, I'll ask about traumas and things of that nature and they go, well, that was 20 years ago, or that was 30 years ago. And I said, you know, it really has an impact. And, and, and many times I'm trying to help them understand the, the physiological impact because you are the cumulative total of everything that you've done or have had done to you, scar tissue and patterns of biomechanical behavior or things of that nature. But the emotional well-being is such a huge part of it as well. If it hasn't been dealt with, and like you said, it can go back into different generations as well. Um, unfortunately, we're kind of getting close to wrapping up here and I could uh, love to pick your brain even more and more. So I'm going to I'm going to have to have you back on again. I, I can tell um, one of the things I would like to end with was I, I know that there's one book that uh, that uh, I had written down. No doctors required. Um, I, I thought maybe you could touch on that and then just maybe end with, you know, how can uh, people maybe follow up with you and, and get more of your resources? Yeah. Yeah, um, my, my good friend Larry Trivieri uh, was the editor of Alternative Medicine Definitive Guide, uh, which I contributed to back in uh, 1992, and then also the, the second edition of that book uh, several years later. And, uh, you know, he's just a very knowledgeable, uh, skilled uh, writer. And uh, he came to me with the idea of, uh, of putting together a book, No Doctors Required. I said, oh, I like that title. Uh, you know, because when I first went into practice in Dallas in 1987, I, uh, I, I had a, a series of lectures that I gave that were called Become Your Own Best Doctor. <laughs> and uh, so it was right, right up that alley. But uh, yes. so, so I helped him find some, some uh, you know, skilled integrative doctors that had a lot of knowledge and experience to interview uh, to get, you know, a lot of the, the, the details that went into the book. And uh, so I, I think he did an excellent job putting that thing together. And, uh, and so the, the Academy of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine that I uh, co-founded back in 2008 uh, has, uh, you know, several doctors that, uh, that are members that, that became uh, contributors to that book. Yeah. But, uh, you know, my, my, uh, uh, I have a, I have a, website still that I participate with that, uh, that's related to that uh, acimconnect.com. Okay. That stands for the Academy of Comprehensive Integrative Medicine, connect.com. And, uh, and so on that, on that website, there's uh, over a, cu a couple of thousand hours of, uh, of valuable educational information in integrative medicine. So if you go to that website and type into the search window on the first page, uh, a topic that you're interested in, usually a course will come up that's related to that. Very Again, good. Uh, yeah. And then the, uh, the other uh, website uh, that I, uh, you know, recently started is called uh, drleecowden.com. Okay. And, and uh, so I have some uh, 
uh, written articles on there that are useful, like uh, sinus irrigation and ketogenic diet and uh, other stuff. So, so people can sometimes find things there when they can't find it on acimconnect.com. Very good. Very good. Hey, well, uh, it's been a, a, a blessing, quite frankly, for you to share, uh, you know, just briefly some of this good information that you've, you know, basically acquired over a, a very distinguished career. So I, I really am thankful for you joining us and blessing us today, Dr. Cowden. Well, thank you for uh, having me on your uh, program, and uh, and I hope that God will continue to bless you. Oh, I appreciate that, and and I'll leave it with, hey, we'll just encourage everybody to be prayerful, and uh, uh, thank you again, and have a have a wonderful day. You too. <laughs>